Hi everyone, I'm Michael Short. This is Let's Go Outdoors. Let's go outdoors where the waters run clear and cold. Mother Nature's world is better than gold. So much to see, so much to do. Let's go outdoors, me and you. Let's Go Outdoors with Michael Short. Supported by the Alberta Conservation Association. Hi everyone, welcome to Let's Go Outdoors. I'm Michael Short. I'm Mary Halbert. And I'm Elma Mehmed Begovic. Coming up, did you know there are over 10,000 forest fires on average each year in Canada? A little later on, we'll introduce you to a site that was intentionally set on fire. Watch you don't get your toes wet. We take a look at a project that sees both biologists and trappers working side by side on a research project that involves a seldom seen animal. Could you survive a night on your own in the woods? Yeah. Our Mary Halbert is going to give it a try. This will protect us from the elements. Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of Let's Go Outdoors. I can't imagine a better Father's Day gift than spending time fishing with your dad. We had an opportunity to tag along during a fishing tournament at Little Bow Provincial Park located east of Nanton. It's mid-morning and we're heading out with guide Bob Bell at the wheel and tournament organizer Greg Beauchamp on deck. We're on Travers Dam. The Little Bow River flows out of this reservoir. It's a nice day and the fish are biting. Keep it in the water. Oh! oh. <laughs> How many fish have you caught? Um, two. Today? Yeah. How many fish have you caught in your entire life? Um, this is my first time, so mostly two. <laughs> Why don't you show them what we're using for bait? Five-year-old Carter, who isn't afraid of a leech, is a first-timer too. He's already figured out how to net the fish. Oh, it's great. You know, I don't get to fish with little kids much, right? And just to see the look on their face when they catch them and uh, playing with the leeches and netting the fish and letting the fish go. I've had about 200 questions today. <laughs> Answered them all. Each team in the fishing derby must consist of one adult angler and two young anglers, 17 and under. You got one to weigh? Cameraman will have to get into it again. Okay, good. Put your head. Fish must be at least 50 centimeters long to qualify and be measured by tournament officials. The longest fish caught today will be declared the winner. How many have you caught so far? Mm, 11. Mitchell has one. Madison and her brother Mitchell go fishing regularly with their dad. All right, high five, catch a fish. Oh! <laughs> The excitement and just being out on the water. It's a good chance for us to bring them out here, kids tournament and all, and let them have a go at it and see if they're any luckier than we are. Another one too small. Madison is riding a hot streak. She reels in her 12th of the day. <laughs> Meanwhile, dockside at Little Bow Provincial Park, the dogs are barking, but the fish aren't biting. That's not always the case. I think the dock fishing here is probably the best in Alberta for catching walleye. Oh my, Chester's got himself into quite a dither, knowing he's chained up while we're heading out to the other side of the lake. Meet last year's winner of the Father's Day Fishing Derby, Braden Welcher. So what's the secret? I don't know. <laughs> You're not going to tell us, are you? Yeah. <laughs> Alongside Braden is Brett Eberts, another former winner. Yeah, I got the 63 centimeter one two years ago, and that's what made us win. So far today, the championship fish has eluded the Eberts boat. We were pre-fishing yesterday. We got three ovaries yesterday, and today they just not opening their mouths. That's fishing. You can't do nothing about it. And we do not have a banana on board. <laughs> It's an old superstition that bananas are bad luck for fishing. The Father's Day Fishing Derby is sponsored by Lund Boats. The original organizer uh, was a president of London and it was a way for him to get his kids out. That's how it all started. And now you see it, lots of young kids. I mean, you've seen there's even some three and four year olds here and, and they're having a blast. 
We have prizes for everybody. We have rods and reels for all the kids. We probably have over $10,000 in prizes, including the boat motor trailer that the top team wins. In the end, though, everyone is a winner. Young anglers are introduced to fishing in a fun environment, and Dad and the kids get to spend Father's Day together, creating memories that will last a lifetime. Both kids and dads looked like they had a really great time together. You know, for many years now, women from across Alberta and from other provinces have gathered at Alfred Lake Conservation Center just outside Caroline. It's here they're introduced to a wide range of outdoor activities. And our very own Mary was up for a challenge to see if she could survive a night in the bush with not much more than a sleeping bag and a tarp over her head. So have you ever been here before, Mary? I've never been here. Okay. I guess you could call this a summer camp for grown-up girls. But to be honest, I am a little surprised there are so many women who are interested in learning about developing their own skills in the outdoors. 50% of you are new, so first of all, we want to say welcome. It's a program that's grown from 21 participants to 176 participants. So we've had to grow and adapt the program over the years, and it's now the largest one in North America. Now, the course I am interested in taking is the Overnight Survival Skills Program, and it seems I'm not alone in terms of selecting this activity. We thought, oh, we'll probably have, you know, half a dozen ladies that are interested in doing it, and we wound up with 50 ladies who registered, and we had to cut it off. It gives them a bit of a sense of what it would be like to be stranded without uh, the kind of shelter and, and resources that they're used to. Did Kelly say stranded? Oh boy, what have I gotten myself into? Well, can't back out now. It's time to join the rest of my merry band and throw the pack on and head out. The, the worst enemy to you in a survival situation would be you, yourself. <laughs> it, it's your psychological enemy. And there's no way in, 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 in the world we can teach you how to combat whatever you bring to the table with respect to learning how to survive. And that is our introduction to understanding the most important element of our survival experience. Know yourself. Where there's smoke, there's fire. Of course, learning other skills like building a fire and shelter are helpful as well. If you use the right materials and you practice that method, if the only thing you get out of tonight is how to do this, you'll have accomplished everything that we've set out as our goal. Once camp was to the point where we thought it to be, well, comfortable, I had a chance to get to know my fellow survivalists. I have to say that I'm, I'm familiar with the basic premises of making a fire and, and making shelter. Mm -hmm. um, however, doing it full-sized with a, in a group environment makes it a really nurturing experience as well as just plain learning, sitting down and saying, this is how you start a fire. No, it makes it fun. Awesome. We're all snug as a bug in a rug. Hopefully all of the bugs stay out of our rugs. And as the, the embers are slowly dying in our fire, we can just kind of think about how lucky we are to be in the great outdoors. <laughs> filming right now? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And then I also dreamt that like I heard this like and I thought it was like a bear like poking around and I was like oh my god. Well with the camp taken down and the fires put out it's time to head back to the main camp at Alfred Lake and listen to some of the feedback from the participants. If there's something that you want to say about the experience that you had. I just think you did a phenomenal job of just keeping it simple enough that I could pick up and actually do it. If you're the adventurous type or if you're not, here's a great place to try new things. From archery to canoeing, moccasin making, there's something here for everyone. Well, for all the ladies anyway. Now how come Mary gets to do a nice summer camping trip and you stuck me out in the cold in winter? Oh, just the luck of the draw, Alma. Yeah, luck of the draw. I bet. Hey, coming up, our theme on learning some survival skills continues. This is my last match, this has to work. 
the Alberta Conservation Association is proud to be partnered with Alberta Fish and Game Association, Alberta Hunter Education Instructors Association, Alberta Professional Outfitters Society, Time now for a look at our outdoor community calendar. While I sampled what it takes to survive a night out in the bush, we now meet a group of students who are learning skills to handle more extreme weather conditions. Outside in an area known as Kelly's Bathtub, it's minus seven Celsius. Inside the visitor center, a group of students from Hinton begin the winter survival program. First of all, a big warm welcome on a cold winter day. First question, what are the four priorities for surviving a night outdoors in the woods? Shelter. Shelter, very good. Let's have you stand right over here. So here's our four priorities and you have got them right now in order of priority. So the first priority is shelter, second is water, fire and food. Travel today will be by snowshoe. It's easy to see many of the students have been on snowshoes before. Off they go, Scott Sunderwall, the Visitor Services Supervisor with Alberta Parks is leading today's program. First lesson, clothing, and why it's important to wear layers and to avoid cotton. Now most of our clothes that we wear at home or at school are cotton because they're comfortable, but in the forest and in cold weather, they're very, very dangerous. When cotton gets wet, it sucks the heat out of your body. If you could only have two things in the bush that you could take with you, they might look like this. So something that you can do some cutting with is very important, something to make a fire. These two can save your life. If you could have more than two things, what would you bring? Inside the tin, it's packed with all sorts of survival gear. Melting water or snow over a fire, right? You could also cook in a tin so it becomes your pot. Lesson one is over. It's off to a frozen Jarvis Lake. Is it safe to be walking on this lake right now? The ice should be 20 centimeters thick. And you'll be happy to know that the ice that you're standing on is probably closer to 60 centimeters. It was so deep, my drill bit couldn't go through it. Repeat after me, I promise not to peek. I promise we not, not to peek. Okay. The next exercise, snowshoeing in a straight line with your eyes closed. Ready, go. Eyes closed, Tyler. The point of this exercise? And if we do that long enough, what happens? We go in a complete circle. Often humans will go in a complete circle. You think you're going in a straight line, but you're not really. I wonder if the importance of winter survival was starting to sink in. Survival is a fun but serious thing and is a very important skill in life and it's good to know because you never know what the situation might be when you're walking in the wilderness. Now it's time to learn two very important priorities for surviving in the outdoors, shelter and fire. So what you have to do is use what you find in nature. The group divides into three teams. The task for this group of boys is to build a fire. They begin by gathering all the materials first. What you want is a nice, matted ball without any snow and lots of air space in there, okay? That fire needs air. It's important to gather all your wood before lighting the fire because it's amazing how quickly a fire can burn through wood. As an added pressure, the boys must pretend they are down to their last match. Too many people who try this, they light back here like they do on the kitchen table and then they move and what happens? It's gone out because you've got wind coming off the lake. This is my last match, this has to work. Does David succeed? Join us next week for part two of Winter Survival.
Well, these kids certainly have some great skills to handle a winter survival situation. Indeed, I know who I'm not calling next time, and that's Alma. But anyways, next time I get into the backcountry, I'm going to call those kids. Okay. Say, Mary, did you know that there is a fish in our eastern slope streams that's threatening the existence of our native cutthroat and bull trout populations? Mm. Conservation groups, government and industry have all collaborated to come up with a plan to deal with the eastern brook trout. It's small, intimate streams like this that can pose a significant challenge to flycasters. Brian Meager is a biologist with Trout Unlimited Canada and offers some thoughts on how to best approach Quirk Creek. What we normally do on this system is come in nice and low and you get all your, uh, your gear all ready. And then when you come into the hole, you just sort of stand back and hope for the best. High sticking works really good here. And you just drop it into the pools. I'm, I'm using a hopper dropper today because we're trying to go with, uh, try to get a little bit of the brookies. Sometimes they're more apt to take the little dropper. And so you just let it go down there and see what happens. And now, since we are talking about brook trout, that is significant to Quirk Creek because since 1998, a special project has been in place to cull back the number of brookies in this stream to allow the cutthroat and bull trout populations to bounce back. As an organization, we have different tools and abilities to get volunteers involved in this project. Uh, a lot of the government organizations don't have the uh, resources to be able to do that. And so we, as a, as a non-profit conservation organization, can, can bring volunteers in with the proper insurance and, and get them educated and get them involved. It's a nice synergy to get people involved and educated and, and, be, and more educated anglers are better anglers. Now, in order to participate in the Stewardship License Pilot Project, you need to pass an exam. It was provincial biologist Jim Stelfox who developed it and is proud of the fact that of the almost 10 thousand fish harvested as part of the program, only 15 were not brook trout. Which is a testament to how well the fish ID test works at educating anglers in how to identify the different, three different species involved here and reducing the chances that they'll mistakenly harvest a native cutthroat or a native bull trout. In order for this program to be successful, it's critical that the harvesting of brook trout take place every year. That means having a good corporate partner. Devon Canada is providing funding for the project to help Trout Unlimited maintain the amount of manpower required to have anglers tested for the fish ID test and doing the supervised outings so they can be certified to get a stewardship license and harvest an unlimited number of brookies from not only Quirk Creek but other streams. And just for the record, yes, I did take the exam. Okay, sir. Well, you got 100%. No way. Absolutely. <laughs> Coming up, just how far east from the Rocky Mountains is the Wolverine Territory? The Alberta Conservation Association is proud to be partnered with Alberta Trappers Association Nature Alberta Wild Sheep Foundation, Alberta. Time now for a look at our outdoor community calendar. No question, the wolverine is an elusive animal to see in the wild. And to get a better picture of just how many of these animals live in Alberta, the Alberta Conservation Association is setting up monitoring stations across the province. It's images like this that attest to the wolverine's tenacious reputation. Yet despite its ability to take down animals much larger than itself, we know very little about the distribution of this seldom seen animal. Enter the Alberta Conservation Association and the Wolverine Monitoring Stations. The bait's looking pretty good. Now, this research station is what we call a run pole uh, concept. It was designed by an Alaskan researcher to get basically the perfect photo of a wolverine. We have alligator clips here um, that upon movement, just from the animal uh, moving through this area, they shift and they go off and they collect hair samples. 
and it doesn't hurt them or anything. We've got a beaver bait suspended above and we've got a camera across from it taking photos that's motion activated. In order to get to the bait, he's got to climb up onto the run pole and he's got to put his feet up here and uh, he can feed, kind of just get a little nibble of the beaver. And while he's doing that, he's essentially exposing this underside of his belly. Why this is kind of the perfect shot is because each wolverine has unique markings along its, its belly side or on its throat. We can tell different individuals based on those unique markings. Uh, we've actually got some of these bars that have, that have gotten bent in the process of wolverines doing chin-ups uh, to get to the bait. Allowing the ACA to expand the program, it received financial support from the Shell Fueling Change Program. So we basically have $50,000 over two years each, so 100000 total. And we're going to be using that, that money for the costly DNA samples. It's not cheap, it costs about $40 to, to analyze per hair sample, so that adds up quickly. In total, the ACA has established 51 monitoring sites across the province. It's hoped this will provide scientists with information on population numbers and the distribution of this iconic animal. Michael, what's next with the study? Well, coming up on a future episode, Alma, we'll take a look at how the Alberta trappers get involved in this project. Now, Michael, what do you do with your old antifreeze containers? Well, if I'm Brad Fence and I figure out a way to use them when I'm ice fishing. Hmm. Hi, I'm Brad Fenson with the Alberta Fish and Game Association with your outdoor tip of the week. This week, we're gonna talk about doubling your success and chances of catching a fish when out ice fishing. You're allowed two lines in the winter, unlike the summer where you're only allowed one. So I always bring my tip-ups. And of course, there's a wide variety of tip-ups available on the market. These are just some of the commercial ones that I have, but they all work the same. Basically, there's something to hold the line and spool out and something to notify you if you get a bite. But you know what? You don't need to go out and spend $20, $30 on a tip-up. For $3.50, you can get a roll of Dacker online and you can make your own homemade tip-ups. Really easy to do. All you have to do is tie the Dacker online to the handle and wrap it around. Attach your hook on the bottom end and you're ready to fish. When you set this down on the ice, it, when a fish grabs it and pulls it, it's gonna unwind and you're gonna hear that jug bouncing across the ice. If you want, you can put rocks or marbles in it to make it more auditory. Now these are really easy to rig up I almost always use a double rig or a quick strike rig. And the reason I do that is because of the way pike feed. We brought some big bait out here today to imitate what they would feed on naturally. So six to eight inch herring work really well. And what you wanna do is take the first hook and put it right in the top of his head so that the points are facing his tail. You take the second one and put it just in behind the dorsal fin. And the reason you do that is so the bait sits horizontal in the water. It looks very natural, it's what the fish are used to seeing. The other reason I do this is if you know anything about pike, what they do with a burst of speed, they come in and grab their prey by the side, they run it through the water and they disorientate it or drown it, they then turn and swallow it head first. And you can see by where my hand placement is, no matter where they grab it, they're gonna have a hook in their mouth. No matter when you get a bite, you can set the hook. And then it's just a matter of putting this little fella to work and get him down there to attract a big pike. If you're heading out ice fishing, save your empty windshield washer jugs, Javex jugs, buy a roll of Dacron and you can make at least six, if not seven or eight of these. Coming up, a walk through a forest that has gone through a remarkable transformation. The Alberta Conservation Association is proud to be partnered with Pheasants Forever, Alberta Council. Treaty 8 First Nations of Alberta. Trout Unlimited Canada. Time now for a look at our outdoor community calendar. One of the tools available to help control the outbreak of wildfires is to do something called a prescribed burn. 
One of these prescribed burns was carried out several years ago, just outside the Banff Jasper Park boundary. The area is now a fantastic interpretive forest that we had a chance to check out ourselves. Interesting to see how the forest is regenerated after the burn. Hey, Corey, how's it going? Leading Mary and I through this remarkable landscape today is Corey Rasmussen who's a biologist with the Alberta Conservation Association, which partnered with Alberta Environment and Sustainable Resource Development on establishing this trail system. Well, the trail's actually been here about uh, two years now. Okay. Uh, we're three years after the burn. And uh, the trail was actually put into place so that it allows Albertans and local hikers and so on and so forth to come out, have the opportunity to see what a burn looks like and how the regeneration process occurs. So we may as well get started. Great. Sounds great. Lead so, on. There's definitely something to see in all seasons for sure. And now, you know, in the spring, things are really starting to green up. You really start to see the uh, leaves coming out on the, the regenerating aspen. Things are really coming into character. It's not long from the staging area that you come across these burnt out trees and you can appreciate what it might have been like to be here when this area was burning. I was wondering how do these lodgepole pines survive and actually start to regrow after like such a strong fire? We've got a pretty good example here of some, uh, some pine cones. You can see uh, that the pine cones are actually open and the fire will you know, bring up temperatures to a certain temperature and these pine cones will open up and release their seeds onto the ground and eventually those seeds will take when the conditions are proper and they'll they'll start to regrow uh, a new tree and hence a new forest. Well, there's actually As our hike program. continued we noticed a familiar resident of these parts the mountain bluebird without a doubt one of the most beautiful birds to be found in Alberta. It became evident that other wildlife have been in the area recently as well as we came across the telltale sign that elk or deer had used these trees as rub sites. All right, well, Mary, I hope you brought your swimsuit. Watch you don't get your toes wet. So one of the things that uh, I know a lot of people are really into, Corey, and that's uh, geocaching. And uh, for another element of fun when you're on the trail here, you can give that a try. Yeah, the Rocky Mountain House uh, Junior Forest Wardens have put a, a geocache in, the, in this location. They actually have it on www.geocaching.com. And it definitely brings a lot of different users to the, to the trail. Other hidden treasures to keep your eyes open for are the highly prized morel mushrooms. Michael, I'm not surprised that you stumbled upon these mushrooms because uh, you're such a fun guy. <laughs> Well, at least our morale is high on this hike, Mary. <laughs> there is also a strong First Nations presence along the trail. This area holds significant spiritual meaning and is signified by these colorful flags. They are actually called prayer flags, and these are actually put up by some of the local indigenous groups, and they're essentially spiritual offerings that they leave behind. And they're generally made of cotton so that they can disintegrate over the time. They should not be disturbed. This is an area of the greatest concentration towards the end of the trail, which sort of, as you're leaving the hike, it really brings a uh, cultural significance to the trail and leaves you with uh, a kind of a unique feeling as you're, as you're departing. What a fantastic day it's been, Corey. Thanks so much for taking us out on the trail. Well, you're quite welcome. I enjoyed having you here. Folks, this trail's here for you to enjoy. If you'd like more information, I would encourage you to check out the Alberta Conservation Association website. Hey, if you would like to catch previous stories featured on Let's Go Outdoors, then track down our website at letsgooutdoors.ca. Remember, the outdoors is here for all of us to enjoy. If you see someone taking away from that enjoyment, call the Report a Poacher line. We leave you now with something we came across while doing the Wolverine story. It's an interesting connection between an aspen tree and a 49 Chevy. Till next time, I'm Alma Mehmedbegovic. I'm Mary Halbert. And I'm Michael Short. Let's go outdoors. I know where I want to be Outside, wild and free Let's go outdoors Let's go outdoors You and me Let's go outdoors